I'm Amanda Waldman. I'm a single mom, farm kid from just outside of Williamsport in Lycoming County. I've lived here my entire life. I'm running because I don't feel that I've had representation in our government for a very long time. I don't see representation even for any of my neighbors. Um, I've never been a political party girl, I guess I want, that's how I could phrase that. I am registered as a Democrat. Um, that's from my grandparents. But I've always looked at issues and looked at the people as individuals. We all have our own concerns. We all have our own opinions. And that was never a reason for me to judge anyone. Um, my campaign, the, my tagline has been basically unbought, unbossed, and unapologetic. I haven't been taking campaign donations from PACs, from political parties, from political operatives, from special interest groups. Donations for my campaign are strictly from the people in the district, regular citizens who, like me, don't have representation, who go to work every day, work hard, and still have the same issues when we get home. How do we pay for our gas? How do we buy our groceries? The price of inflation. Um, that means that I'm unbossed by most of the corrupting factors in politics. I'm not owned by a party. I'm not owned by a, a corporation or a lobbyist group. And I intend to be that way. The only bosses that will tell me what they need done and what they want to see done in DC are the people that I am elect, I hope to be elected to serve. That's a, a little about me. Mike? All right, let's start off by uh, talking about what your plan and positions are regarding um, uh, the economy and, in, in, and inflation. So, <clears throat> apologies there, I clear my throat. We are currently, the, the current situation with inflation, um, the prices have risen so dramatically because we are so heavily reliant on oil. Back when we went into the COVID shutdowns in April, March of 2020, fast forward April of 2020, President um, Trump actually went to Saudi Arabia to the OPEC nations and to American oil producers. That it was necessary. He went to stabilize the oil market. As if anyone remembers, gas prices plummeted rapidly. Barrels of oil were zero dollars. When we reopened, production never increased back up to demand. So one of the things I wanna focus on is how do we get our production back where it needs to be? In America, in Saudi Arabia, in the um, United Arab Emirates. Out of OPEC, we're completely ignoring Russia right now because of the war in Ukraine. And we're gonna need to figure out how to make up for those 5 million barrels of oil a day out of, U out of Russia. One way we can do that is, and these are, these are long-term solutions, we focus on being more energy independent, which means we start to focus on solar, wind, geothermal. We focus on the job creation for those as well, but that's not gonna be an instant solution. Um, as I already mentioned, getting the production back up where it needs to be, President Biden did go to Saudi Arabia, what, April of this year or March, May of this year. And there's actually a resolution sitting in our foreign affairs committee right now that's been there since May 12th. That is to address these production issues. And it hasn't moved. It has moved, not moved at all since May 12th. So is there anything that, would be that uh, excuse me, is there anything that the Congress can do now to kind of alleviate the situation to make things to help the people out who are struggling with the rising costs? What we could do now is get that resolution passed, make the agreement with Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and get our American production back online. We need to start producing the oil. We also need to address the price gouging. 
And I'm not saying, um, I believe the congressman had mentioned we're blaming small gas station owners. I'm not saying that in any way, shape or form. I'm saying that traveling through all 12 of my counties in this district, I have seen gas prices fluctuate 80 to 90 cents, depending on what county I'm in. You know, they, they can be a minimum of 30 miles away or they can be 70 miles apart. There's no reason that there should be that dramatic of a price difference for a gallon of gas if this is strictly based on inflation and supply and demand. That is price gouging, and that's something we need to address immediately as well. Your website refers to, uh, to uh, promoting and trying to make sure everyone has a living wage. Can you tell us what exactly you see as a living wage and how you would, what type of legislation you would support to, to get that done? Well, obviously, I support a raise in the minimum wage. Um, we have not had a, a cost of living wage increase. The American people have not had this for, what was it, 2004, 2008. Congress, members of Congress, they've been under a pay freeze since 2010. They had a cost of living increase every year up until 2010, but the American people never did. They're at 170 some thousand dollars a year now, but Americans, are making 750 an hour and they're supposed to be able to live on that. And I feel this way because I'm a single mom. For my kid's life, I had to work multiple minimum wage jobs, a combination of full and part-time work, including as a bartender and a waitress, just so I could feed, clothe and house my children. So to tell us that we're not working hard enough or we don't deserve this raise or we're going to hurt the economy. If we don't have money to spend on Main Street, if we can barely survive. How are we supposed to help the economy that way either? So this, I mean, it's, it's common sense. If your people can't afford to live, there's a problem. And what would you like to see the minimum wage raised to? At least $15 an hour. If the wages had stayed tied to inflation as they were in the early 60s, we would be at 20 some dollars an hour right now. And now we cannot make a jump from 750 to 20 something an hour. We can't do that to our small businesses, to our main street businesses, but we cannot stay in the dark ages and expect people to, to survive. And what are your positions on Medicare and social security? So I currently work for a Medicare contractor. I'm a financial rep. I myself would love to have the option of choosing Medicare over my current insurance plan. And I have a fairly decent insurance plan. But the amount of money that I could save by going by choosing a Medicare plan is astronomical. Um, our senior citizens our disabled people rely on Medicare. They rely on their social security benefits. So I don't wanna see them discontinued. I don't want to see sunsetting or for either of these policies that protect the people that are paid for directly out of our paychecks. I don't wanna see them have to come up for a vote every five years. Because as we see right now, what, le what happens to legislation in government now? It sits there, we have finger pointing, blame laying, this party, that party, blah, blah. That doesn't help a single person in this country. It's un-American. So to take away a safety net, a social safety net of social security and Medicare is unconscionable. And if you, you want to send it to the private sector, there is nothing preventing private companies right now from offering these 401k benefits to employees. Many of us have it. But as we saw in 2008 with the market crash, what happened to everyone's retirement when it was solely based on 401ks? People were losing 
hundreds of thousands of dollars. That was their retirement package. My parents had to extend their working time because of that crash. So we want to put everyone in a miracle on that. And in five years from now, if we don't take a vote to keep Social Security and Medicare going, what happens to the money that each and every one of us paid into it? Because I am not making a donation that large to our government to use for some deficit that they created because they're incapable of balancing a budget. And uh, I recall the Build Back Better plan had some changes proposed in Medicare that weren't ultimately approved, uh, lowering the age to, I believe, 60 and expanding some of the coverage for, um, I guess, dental and eye, and eye uh, vision. Um, do you support any of those types of changes? Um, we all appear to be of a similar age in this, in this Zoom. Um, how did you all feel about hearing that you wouldn't be able to retire at 65? You may have to wait till 67 or 70. That wasn't a good feeling for me. Um, so are there changes that need to be made? Absolutely. Do we need to remove it completely from the table? No. I would support a lower um, retirement age. If people can afford to retire at 62, let them. There shouldn't be a forced mandated retirement age, but if they're able to retire at 62, let them. Um, I, don't, I don't think we need to demand that people work beyond the years that they have to. And, and what do you think about health care in general? And what do you think about how the Affordable Care Act has operated? So the Affordable Care Act, um, there were obvious issues when it was passed. Was it needed? Yes. What legislators have failed to do is fix the problems as they come up. There were huge loopholes. There were huge problems. Why would you not address the problem and help the constituents in everyone's district? Why are the legislators just pointing fingers? I don't want someone yelling at someone else because they didn't get it done. I want you to do the damn job. Go in, do the work. Because as far as I can remember, I don't remember ever seeing the DNC or the RNC walking into polling places and electing someone. I see my neighbors, myself, walking into the polling place, electing our representative. And I want that representative to do the work. And that includes fixing problems as they come up. Don't just throw it away. You fix it. As far as our healthcare system, when we decided to go public and make all of our hospitals for profit, allow that to happen, that is when we saw the dramatic increase in the cost of healthcare. And it's, it's just going to keep going higher. Some of them still claim to be nonprofit, but each of their presidents and CEOs salaries would suggest otherwise. People can't afford to pay rent. They can't pay their mortgages. They can't afford anything to happen. They can barely afford co-pays when they go to the doctor. They can't afford gas to get to work. They can't afford, ch or afford childcare. What makes us think that we can allow the healthcare system to keep rising out of control, bankrupting more and more families? So that needs a hold overhaul. I was, that was going to be my next question. I and mean, what would you propose as far as reforms of the healthcare system? A complete and total overhaul. I want an explanation for why families are facing. So in the emergency room, and this is one of my own personal medical bills from, it's been a few years ago now. In the emergency room, a bag of saline on my itemized bill, because I requested it, was $700. A bag of saline is water and salt. Put in a special sterile bag, sterile tubing, and an IV. 
where's the $700 come from? No idea. You can go into your doctor's office or you can go into a scheduled surgery and that same bag of saline is $400. Why is it $400? This cost a hospital four or five, maybe $10. So think things like that. The open billing, the telling us how much we're going to pay before we have a service, being able to shop around. If we really want this to be in the, the vein of capitalism, then I should be able to shop around. I shouldn't have through my insurance company in network or out of network. I should be able to go wherever they're going to offer me the best price, right? Isn't, isn't that how our economy goes? We, we pick the best for ourselves. So this is another reason that I support a Medicare option for everyone. I'm not about to tell anyone that they have to take this specific company, that one, they have to go here, they have to go there. That's one of the more un-American things I've come across. But I want a company who has already negotiated prices so that I can go to any doctor and they can say, well, I'm going to charge you $700 for a specialty visit. And Medicare can be like, okay, well, I only, we're only going to pay you 130. We pay 80, the patient pays 20. Whereas my insurance will pay 90% of that. I have to pay 10 and the prices just keep going to go. So there are, a million and one solutions, but none of them are being looked at and nothing is actually happening with the rising cost of healthcare. And no one's answering the questions. How would you fund a Medicare option for everyone? How do we fund the Medicare option now? Through uh, our taxes, correct? Actually, it's through our deduction from our paycheck. It's not a tax because the rest of government cannot touch the money we put into Medicare and Medicaid. If people choose the, this option, they're paying in already. They'll continue to pay in. You still have a premium. You still have a deductible that has to be met. Um, we're not adding any additional that we can't pay for. Is it raising another tax? No. Do I want to see taxes increased? Not on regular Americans. But here in the ninth district, if you're making over $400,000, you're not considered low income. You're not middle in, you know, middle class level. You're pretty well off at $400,000 a year. The rest of us are scraping by at $36,000 a year. So if you make under that $400,000, you shouldn't see a tax increase. I do agree with that plan by the president. 400,000 and above, you're not living paycheck to paycheck and you can afford to pay your own fair share. At so 400,000, there are a lot of different loopholes in the tax laws that they can take advantage of that the rest of us cannot. We can't even dream of taking advantage of them. So I take it you wanna raise taxes on anyone on income earners above 400,000? I would agree with that policy that's already been proposed. I agree with closing the tax loopholes that corporations fit through. If you're operating in America, you're employing American workers, you should still be paying taxes in America. Now, when we talk about small business owners, the business tax for your small mom and pop main street businesses, that should not be higher than a personal income tax level. They're the ones that cannot afford this. But Amazon, not paying taxes in the U.S., I can't leave my house any day of the week and not see Amazon delivery trucks, see FedEx dropping off Amazon packages, see UPS or the Postal Service. There's zero reason that they can't pay taxes in this country. That alleviates the burden on the regular people who keep this country running. We make the money for corporations. We make it for the businesses. Do you want to you see a, a repeal of all those Trump tax cuts from 2017? And I believe the biggest the biggest tax cut was for the corporate income tax. Yeah. Yeah. Because the 
the last group of people that needs help surviving are corporate CEOs, boards of directors. I'm pretty sure Elon Musk does not need a tax cut. I mean, people can feel free to disagree with that, but if you look at your own income and you compare it to theirs, who do you think would benefit and help Main Street by having money in their pocket? It's not Elon Musk. He's not here in Williamsport. He's not downtown Hughesville or Pottsville. Can you tell us what your position is on abortion and do you support federal legislation to uh, regarding abortion policy? So I'm always baffled when it's, do you support abortion? Because if I say yes, then everyone's like, you're a baby killer. And when I say no, you don't support women's rights. Well, the long and short of it is that an abortion is the removal of any tissue at all from a uterus. I'm specifically qualified to talk about a uterus as I have one. I know what I have to go through every year. I know what life as a woman is like and how I'm already treated. Lower pay than the men, not equal accessible health care is what we want now. This would also apply to uterine cancer. How about a biopsy? You're removing tissue from a uterus. I suffered a miscarriage many, many, many years ago. It is one of the most heartbreaking, horrible things you can go through. Many women don't tell people they went through one. I didn't until this became a thing. But now you want to criminalize that too? And when I say you, I don't mean you personally. I mean a specific party who is hell-bent on making religion our new constitution when our country was founded on freedom of religion and the separation of church and state. I don't want to infringe on the rights of anyone. Our constitution guarantees that to everyone. My personal choice, as I've mentioned, I'm a single mom. Obviously, I chose to have my kids. That's my personal choice. I'm not going to force what I would do on anyone else because their life is not mine. When you start to take those rights away from any group, any group at all, it makes it easier to take the rights from the next group and the next group and the next group. The, the so house. if women don't have rights, are we going to suddenly, will the next thing be, we, we can't have contraception, we can't have equal access to health care, we have to have a man's permission again. Are we going to lose our banking ability again as well? We've only had that since the 70s. Are we then going to lose our right to carry a gun? If our Second Amendment right because where women is taken away, does that mean anyone else's Second Amendment right is going to be safe? You see, there's, there's a, a whole slope. You just have to knock out one group at a time, and then all of your rights are gone. The House did pass, uh, pass uh, an attempt to codify Roe v. Wade, and it, and it had failed in the Senate. If, if that comes up for a vote again, would you support that? Yes. I will support codifying the rights of every single person in this country. Right now, women's rights are being attacked and these are life and death rights. This isn't just, I don't think you should have an abortion because you'll kill a child. Clearly we're not killing children. That's not our intent. Uh, what is your position on uh, climate change and reducing carbon emissions and uh, the use of fossil fuels. We were given one planet to live on. If you want to go to the religious aspect of this, would God want us destroying our planet for all of the God and religion people out there saying women can't control their own bodies? For me, I want to know that I live in a rural area. I have my own well. I have my own septic. I want to know the water I'm drinking out of my well is clean. I want to know 
that the water my kids are drinking is clean. I don't use pesticides on my own property for that reason. I don't want it seeping into the groundwater and affecting my neighbors. Um, fossil fuel, I'm right now surrounded by um, five drilling wells for the Marcella Shale. They're not producing. You know, we're out here, we're all lease owners. We were kind of forced into a block. And when they were producing, we get between 20 and $80 every three months. That's it. This isn't some big money thing. We pay the taxes for these industries drilling from our cellar shell gas. If they're not producing, clearly we don't need to keep drilling more wells until the ones we have are done producing. That's how I view that. I'm not against it. Um, I'm not particularly happy with the noise, the filth, um, and the pollution. But it's a necessary evil. I do want to see us focus forward. Fossil fuels are not forever. They're a, they are a limited supply. And if we don't far, focus on harnessing more green energy options, we're going to dry up that fossil fuel faster. We need to become, in America in general, needs to become a leader in technology, a, an innovator in this world again. Right now, we're, we're struggling to hang on and keep up with other countries. To me, there's no need for it. Our workers, our employees, our corporations, our children, we have brilliant, amazing, hardworking people here. Why wouldn't we want to promote ourselves as being a leader again? Why wouldn't we want to promote our people? That's also going to help with supply chain issues. If we're making it here, we don't have to wait for it to be shipped in from another country. What do you want to see the U.S. do to make the U.S. energy independent? We can start with solar. We can start with wind. We can do geothermal. We can make it available on a larger scale. We can start with the, Chi the Chips and Science Act. That's one of the things that that does. Creates jobs right here so that we're making our own technology for these um, industries so that we can start new industries, build our own solar panels here, not wait for everything from another country. Right now, China and Taiwan, that's where a lot of our microchips come from, for our vehicles, our computers. We can do that here. Why aren't we focusing on that? Why is it taking so long to start focusing on that? What do you think of uh, these Republican plans that are promoting and calling for uh, election integrity? The most patriotic American thing that any citizen can do is vote. So to me, our elections should always, we should always ensure that they are fair and free. That includes voting machines, um, voting software. But the thing is we don't have voting machines right here. We're, we're voting on paper. We have a scanner that we put our ballot in that counts the vote and then there's a hand recount and the numbers have to match. So if you don't have a machine that's actually tallying votes and it's not tallying who got what, but if, if you have 500 ballots in hand at a hand count and the machine says you should only have 400, so you have to keep rectifying, recounting making sure your numbers match. I don't see how that means election that the election is not safe. I don't want to point fingers from party to party. That's not why I'm running. I can understand being concerned, hearing stories and investigating them. And every story was investigated. Pennsylvania had multiple audits done. Here in Lycoming County, they want to do another one, another hand count. How much is that costing the taxpayers here? We haven't got that answer yet. 
it's already been done. How many times do we have to keep doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting a different result? It's the definition of insanity. It's been two years. It is time to move on, lick your wounds. You have two years till the next election. Lying and making citizens hate each other based on a political party and some lies and nonsense is the most un-American authoritarian thing I have ever seen. So do I want to focus on cybersecurity? Absolutely. That's something I think we should definitely be investing in. We should definitely have more people watching, make sure there are no outside actors trying to interfere in our elections. But when we have those people and we invest that money, we need to close our mouths and listen to them as well. If they alert us and say, hey, this is what's happening, then we need to shut the hell up, do the job, listen to the experts and take action, not ignore it and hide it from the American people. What do you think of the U U.S. policy regarding the war in Ukraine? Um, which aspect? Just do you Just do you overall. support do you support how the Biden administration has handled it and then the the funding that the Congress has has allocated to support the Ukrainians? I do. I do support how NATO in general has responded to the crisis in Ukraine, to the war in Ukraine. It's not even a crisis anymore. Um, and President Biden is in line with NATO. We are a NATO nation. We just voted earlier this year for the biggest Department of Defense spending increase ever. Can we not send more weapons? Does it always have to be money? Are we counting the money and the weapons as, as one thing? Are we delineating, making a, diff a notation on the difference between the two? And to me, we've lost enough American lives in endless wars in other countries that didn't make us any safer here at home. So I'm always going to balance the lives of our veterans, all of our active service members over sending them in. So if we decide we're gonna just stop sending money and or weapons to the Ukraine, are we then going to start sending troops because that's not an acceptable answer. That creates a war. Are we just gonna let it go and not send anything or anyone and let Russia have them? And at that point, what then stops Russia from moving into our NATO nations, our, NATO, our allies surrounding the Ukraine? At what point are we willing to say, well, I guess World War III is inevitable, let's just do it. So veterans' lives to me are gonna come over they're gonna be priority. Safety at home, safety of our allies, so that we don't suddenly become one country against the world again, that we have to worry about takeover. Where's that line? And if we stop the funding and we stop, we stop the rest, how do we know what's gonna happen? And, and is that what the rest of America is willing to do? Are we willing to send our men and women to another endless war? or to another world war. I noticed on your website that you uh, addressed reforms to criminal the criminal justice system. Can you talk about that? And do you support any, any new measures to address crime as well? So I come from a family of military law enforcement corrections officers. Um, to me, public servants such as them, they're, they're putting their lives on the line. They signed up and volunteered to do these jobs that are absolutely necessary. What I don't like to see is our police officers, not only did they have to, you know, not all of them have to go to school, but a lot of them went for criminal justice. They have student loans. They're serving the general public. That's, they're peacekeepers. That's what they're there for. They're not social workers, they're not psychologists, they're not doctors, they're not lawyers. 
They're not judges. They're not reporters. Why do we keep piling on duty after duty after duty onto our officers? We should be providing backup for them. They're going to a domestic violence scene. Why not have social workers? Why not have crisis interventionists? Why do they have to go and do it all themselves and alone? That's putting their lives at more risk. Um, so I, I would like to see community building. I would like to see more community funding for the other services that can partner with our police departments, with our law enforcement. I would like to see marijuana legalized. Um, if someone is caught with paraphernalia, say um, a pot pipe in their pocket, why should they go to our local jail? Even for an overnight, why are they in a county jail? Because that's on us as citizens. That's not on the jail. That's not on the person. That's on us. What we get out of fines and fees does not make up for the amount that it costs to house a single in inmate. Right now in Lake Cumming County, one of, our, um, one of our cell blocks had to shut down because we were understaffed. And each of the inmates that our county prison had was $4,000 an inmate to transfer to another local county. And then in addition to that, we also had to pay the other county for the daily fees. Do you think any one of those people transported paid $4,000, $5,000 in fees and fines? Where, where are we gonna make up that kind of money? So opening up space in our prisons by removing marijuana from uh, the uh, schedule one drugs, wiping these, what should have been misdemeanors instead of felonies, these are nonviolent. And I'm talking nonviolent people only. I mean, I personally have never seen someone who smokes marijuana be any more violent than they are when they're destroying a bag of chips or a pizza. That's the most violence I've ever seen. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, maybe it does. But nonviolent offenders should not be sitting in a prison soaking up tax dollars. What do you think about Again, the um, qualified immunity for police officers? I believe that there are 99% good cops but I believe there are 1% cops who are not so good. And that 1% should not fall under the umbrella of qualified immunity based on the reputations of the other 99%. No one in this country should ever be above the law and that includes our police officers. So if you do wrong, but again, it goes back to why are we expecting police officers to perform every single aspect when they could have backup and other profession, professions helping them? Why put them under that much strain? And um, what do you think the federal government should do to, to address the opioid crisis? Mental health services starting in schools starting in, in high school, middle school. Um, by the time someone realizes that they need, that they could use a counselor or use therapy, they're in their 20s or 30s. Damage has already been done and it's just been reinforced. So, and, and ending the stigma around mental health, it's getting better but we're not great. And if people need help, they need to be able to access it and not be condemned, made fun of, bullied. We do need to, and I'm sure you're gonna to get to this question, we do need to strengthen the security at our borders. It doesn't mean we need to turn everyone away. It doesn't need, mean that we need to exacerbate a situation or exaggerate it by saying, oh, you know, 
hundreds of thousands when it's a couple of hundred. Um, really looking for these drug runners, really searching all of the vehicles that cross the border because it's not just the Southern border that they're getting through. You know, there are wealthy people with yachts who happen to also be running drugs. You can check that with the Coast Guard. It's not just one line, it's just that's the line that people wanna focus on, but it's not the only way it's happening. So being secure all the way around is the way we should be focusing, not getting everyone worked up and making them fearful of something that's not as real as they want to pretend it is. And um, regarding immigration, do you support any other immigration reforms? Um, I guess some have said maybe we should uh, should increase the number of, of legal immigrants who can get into the country to alleviate the, uh, jo the worker shortage. That is possible. I don't see any harm in legal immigration. Um, all of our country, again, was founded on that with immigrants from every country coming to the country who, you know, we have the Statue of Liberty holding the torch, a shining beacon of freedom around the world. And we want to blame people for wanting to come here. So maybe increasing legal immigration would be a good idea. Another idea that I've had is why are we forcing immigrants who are seeking asylum in our country to travel onto American soil to claim asylum? Why can't they go to the nearest American embassy instead? Why can't we change that law so that they can? Why are we making two distinctions between asylum and refugee status? That, that seems to me a, a simpler fix. If we have people from Colombia, Guatemala, Venezuela flocking together in a caravan of illegals, when they're just coming to seek political asylum, why not let them go to their nearest American embassy and claim that refugee slash asylum? That to me just seems to be common sense. But then again, do you um, do you support any new um, federal gun control measures? So I'm actually a gun owner myself. I know that it doesn't matter which political party occupies the White House or the Senate or the ha state or the, the Congress. Nobody's coming to take my guns because it hasn't happened at any point in the past. They're not going to. I'm secure in the knowledge that I own my own weapons and I have the right to do so under the Second Amendment. I do support um, training, specialized training for assault weapons. I do support age limitations on owning assault weapons. Um, the Second Amendment doesn't say you can all own guns with zero regulation. It says a well-regulated militia. We have the right to bear arms. We don't have the right to bear arms unregulated free for all. This isn't the wild, wild west. So common sense regulation doesn't seem to be that bad of an idea. We require it for anyone going into our police force. We require it for guards at federal um, prisons. We require the training for our military men and women. At 18, you have to be trained on how to use those weapons. You have to be able to tear down and put back together your weapon in whatever number of seconds the drill sergeant is going to scream at you. You have to go to training two weeks every year to maintain ownership in the military of your military issued weapon. Why would we let an 18 year old senior in high school walk into a gun store and buy an assault 
white rifle without having any kind of safety training, any kind of knowledge other than how to load it and pull a trigger. That just, it doesn't make sense if we require it from our heroes. Not to mention, does anyone look at some of the kids now, 18 and in high school, and hear Tide Pod or read the warning labels that we have to put out now? I don't want someone who I have to tell not to eat a Tide Pod to go into a gun store and buy an assault rifle. Do you think 21 is an appropriate age? There's no problem with 18 year olds if they're going to go through the training, if they're going to be responsible, if we are going to actually regulate and enforce the regulations, that's another issue. We have to make sure whatever regulations we have are enforced. Pennsylvania is a state we have we have a ton of gun laws on the books already. Most of them are not enforced. So part of this whole conversation goes with enforcement as well. We have to make sure enforcement is, is funded. Your website uh, also raises the issue of uh, education and, and student loan debt. Do you think, do you support what the president recently did regarding uh, student debt forgiveness? And uh, do you think maybe that the Congress should go even farther than that? I do support the um, loan forgiveness. Um, whether we go any further than that, I'm not sure. I'm, I support unions. I support apprenticeship programs. One of my children went through the VOTEC program here at our local high school. I support VOTEC programs. I have community colleges that will teach these additional courses as well. Um, I think it depends on a student. It depends on your background. It depends on your goal. What's your version of the American dream? And I don't think that we should be preventing people from following a dream because they have to go to a specific college for a specific degree. None of your in-state colleges offer it, things like that. They, they shouldn't be limited on their dreams because they grew up in a, a not well-off family. I can't afford to pay for, my, for either of my kids to go to college. My oldest had to do that on his own. My youngest is saving and doing that on his own. He's only a junior in high school, so he still has some time. Do I want to see them graduate, follow their dreams, but immediately upon graduation from college, be a hundred to $200,000 in debt. That's a bit much. Um, I'm sorry, there. Oh, the education in general. So one of the biggest issues, and I'm sure this is statewide, this is probably nationwide, people complain about property taxes. Here in this district, our property taxes go to fund our schools. They get upset when property taxes go up every year. So if the federal government would pay the mandates that they promised, they promised to fund states for education mandates and they have never done so. The state then has to pick up the tab and make up for money that they were counting on from the federal government in order to fund education. States can only make up so much and then it falls to the school district to make up the difference. And that falls onto the taxpayers, increased property taxes to make up what's missing. So if the federal government, and that's one thing I'm going to push for, we have to fund the education mandates. We require each state to meet certain criteria. That state requires it from the school. If we're going to put a burden on someone else, we need to make sure that we're funding that burden. You also mentioned on your website uh, failed economic policies that have hurt family farms. Can you just address that? I watched my family farm be sold off to developers when my grandfather was diagnosed with cancer. Um, it was a terminal, very short period of time. So I grew up and across from my house, um, it was a cornfield. 
behind my house is a cornfield. And this wasn't, we didn't produce for sale. This was really family sustaining. Um, the farm was literally catty corner from my house. We had a couple of cows and a couple of pigs and some chickens and quail. And when he was diagnosed, my family scrambled my aunts and uncles to buy as much as they could because my grandfather had to set my grandmother up. See, he was a union worker and he was able to provide for his whole family, keep his small farm running on that one job. And so my grandma never worked a day in her life. They were barely 70. I now have 12 houses in the field across from me, three on the hill behind me, farm burned down, there's two more houses over there. That's what's happening to all of our small farms. Our children are walking away from all sm our small farms because it's too much of a struggle. It's too hard to keep even the small ones going. It becomes more profitable just to sell off the land to either a developer or to a big agricultural corporation. So we give handouts and we give subsidies to farmers. Why are we preventing them from the market competition? Why can't they compete? Why are regulations on small farms? Why are we making it so much harder on them? One of the bills that is a huge focus for me is the Prime Act. That allows meat producing farms to sell their organic homegrown livestock at the local grocery store through their own butcher. It requires lightening up a few regulations on the local butcher shops. They already have passed all of their health inspections. That doesn't change. These are safe for us to go to, but especially during COVID, if the Prime Act had been implemented, had been passed, instead of going off to a committee and being tabled for years, we wouldn't have had a meat shortage. We could have gone into the grocery store and had beef, pork, sausage, bacon, chicken, turkey, bison from our neighbors. And our small farms wouldn't have had to euthanize a lot of their livestock. So those are, that's just one of the examples of failed economic policy. Why do we make it so much harder for small farms, but we give so much away to huge corporations? 